All right. So at various points, a few of you, Will Berlin, have asked for sort of like more background knowledge, like things that you want to know about the topic before you show up at the tournament and get asked sort of awkward cross-ex questions. Um, so this is going to be the kind of first installment for the confidential sources topic um, on sort of like background things you would know just from, from sort of like reading law review articles. They, they generally have like a lit review section. Um, so most of the things I'm going to talk about here are things that I found in those lit review sections when reading these law reviews. Um, so this, this is the topic, the like official wording. Um, so we're going to talk about like what these various words mean in sort of like a legal context. Then we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, in sort of the bonkers world of LD, what people are likely to interpret these words to mean and sort of how that shapes up the topic. Okay, so in the United States, reporters ought to have the right to protect the identity of confidential sources. Um, so in the United States, um, I mean, that kind of obviously means like within the legal territory of the U.S. Um, that is a little complicated by this process because I don't really know why they worded it this way. If they meant the reporters have to be from the U.S., if they meant the reporters have to be living in the U.S. when they're being challenged about the confidential source, um, I don't really know, and that wording is kind of awkward. So to give an example, WikiLeaks is an international organization that does a huge amount of sort of the um, unauthorized disclosure of confidential information. WikiLeaks is not located in the United States. As far as I know, um, from just a couple articles that I read about it, that's a conscious choice. There's nothing associated with WikiLeaks, be it a computer, a modem, a flash drive, a person. Um, in the United States or in countries that have extradition agreements with the United States. So an extradition agreement means like, let's say you commit a crime in Beats's country, and then you flee and you move to my country. Well, if I have an extradition agreement with Beats, what it means is that I will agree to send you back to, you know, Beatsville or whatever his country is um, so that you can face prosecution. So the, the reason WikiLeaks is set up so that no one was working in the U.S., um, is because the U.S. goes after people who leak this kind of information. So one of the kind of like odd AF arguments um, will be that if we don't have a federal shield law in the U.S., um, that people will just leak the information to non-U.S. journalists. Um, so, for example, you have a press report about, or not a press report, obviously, you have a classified document about um, drone strikes in Yemen, and you go to release that to a reporter at the New York Times, and they say, uh, I can't guarantee that I'll be able to keep your name confidential if someone tries to investigate where this came from. Well, all you would do then is, you know, hang up on them and call a reporter from The Guardian, which is like a UK based newspaper um, or, you know, some other foreign source of information, not source, I guess, reporter on information. And then you will be their source and say, OK, well, can you guarantee me confidentiality? Um, so the, in the United States part is a little bit tricky. But I think generally what it's going to be interpreted to mean by people in LD is that like you have to apply to the whole country. So, you know, in, in the status quo, there's like 49 states um, that have some kind of shield law. There's also um, kind of 13 district courts that have various interpretations of whether or not a reporter's privilege exists. So affirmative shouldn't be able to say the like, oh, we'll just do a shield law in Wyoming or we'll have the third district change its interpretation. Um, that's mainly what in the United States is probably put in the topic for us to say it has to be uniform everywhere. OK, reporters. Um, so that's a highly conflicted term. So I just said that like 49 states have shield laws um, in every one of those states. They have a different definition of either the term reporter or the term journalist. So what counts as a reporter and therefore who gets the privilege? Um, so like, why is this an important thing? OK, well, like, let's say, uh, you know, like you and your friends are hanging out on a Friday night um, and one of your friends like backs up their car and hits a mailbox or something. OK, and then you all decide to drive away and someone reports that they saw that crime. Well, people are actually worried that if the interpretation of reporter was too broad, um, like let's say you have a blog or like an Instagram page where you post photos with commentary and the police said who, you know, was driving the car at the time. And you said, well, I'm asserting my privilege as a reporter to maintain source confidentiality and not disclose who this is. Well, people are worried that, you know, criminals will start to use that as a defense. So. You know, four people commit a robbery and one of them gets caught. Well, that person could say, oh, I was reporting on this robbery. And so therefore, I don't have to reveal my confidential sources. Um, so 
there's kind of a lot of different ways that you could define reporter. Um, the kind of strictest, most traditional is that you have to work for a news organization. So like if you work at CNN, you're a reporter. If you work at 7-Eleven, not a reporter. Um, the kind of problem with those definitions is that the media landscape is changing quite a bit or has changed quite a bit. Uh, and so the people who do a lot of what we consider reporting oftentimes don't work for major news organizations. They're either freelance reporters, which means they get paid per assignment, not on like a salary. Um, a lot of times they run their own blog or um, you know their own news magazine where they'll send out a newsletter or something, but they won't have uh, sort of corporate sponsorship in the way the New York Times will, for example. Um, so against that sort of traditional, you have to work for a news organization. The kind of most commonly asserted counter definition is that it's not about who you work for, or your employment status. It's about what is your work product, like what is the goal of what you are doing. Um, so they would look at that case with the, you know, backing up and hitting the mailbox and they would say, well, looking at your Instagram, the majority of things that you Instagram are like food. Um, so you do not appear to be a criminal investigative reporter. And so we don't think that you're covered by the reporter's privilege here. OK, so there are different definitions of what reporter could be and who could be covered by the privilege. Um, editors is like a big thing in that, like are editors covered by the privilege. So like if I work at The New York Times, which is like an organization um, with a lot of journalists and editors and I get help on a story and I tell someone who's helping me, my source is X, you know, do they also get the privilege if they're just an editor? These are all kind of things that come up in the definition of what is a reporter and sort of why does it matter? Um, so hopefully we'll have a negative strategy that's just sort of like, what does the affirmative say a reporter is? And then we'll read a pick to consider a reporter something else. Um, we also have some like spec cards that say that if you don't clarify or define who is a reporter, um, when you craft your shield law, then it's going to fail. So the term reporter is going to be an important one for the topic and is not as um, sort of uh, straightforward as you might initially suspect. Um, ought to have the right. OK, so what is a right? Well, you're, it's a right to not say something. So kind of the most analogous thing is probably the Fifth Amendment, which gives you a right to not incriminate yourself. Um, so what does that mean, the right to not incriminate yourself? Well, let's say someone is asking you, like, did you witness a crime? OK, and by just saying, yes, you witnessed that crime, you would be revealing like that you were not at work where you were supposed to be or maybe you were under contract to be doing something else during that time. Um, and so by saying that you witnessed the crime, you're admitting that you may have committed a crime yourself. OK, so the Fifth Amendment says you don't have to reveal information that could potentially be used against you in, in that or in a different criminal prosecution. OK, so reporters, when they're getting asked um, to reveal information on sources, that can come up in a variety of contexts. But the kind of most obvious ones are um, what's called a grand jury, which a grand jury is someone, or it's not someone, it's a group of people who convene um, to judge the merit of criminal charges. So like if I wanted to you know, charge Beats with being a tyrant, I would have to convene a grand jury, um, which I think is like 23 or 21 people. And then the, the district attorney, the prosecutor gets to present their evidence. There's no defense. And then those people judge based on the evidence if they think there's enough, uh, you know, of a basis to charge that person with a crime. So basically, when you're a prosecutor, you know, you just had the plea bargaining topic. You can't just like randomly go up to people and be like, crime, I charge you. You have to get those charges approved by someone. That's what the grand jury does. So most of the time when reporters are being asked to break privilege, what's happening is the, the government suspects someone of committing a crime, you know, like hacking into the NSA or of releasing government documents that were classified. Um, and so what they're doing is they're saying we suspect this person of a crime as evidence. We want the journalist to corroborate their identity. OK, so the journalist will get called to testify through a subpoena, which is a legal document that says you have to show up on this date and answer questions. They'll get a subpoena that says you have to show up at this grand jury um, and testify about XYZ issue. And then obviously one of the questions they're gonna ask you about XYZ issue is, where'd you get this information from? Like who told you the US was conducting drone strikes here or whatever it is. Okay, so having a right to protect that identity would mean that there is no legal consequence for you not disclosing that information. Okay, so to get back to the Fifth Amendment, you can assert your Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. The government can't then be like, well, if you're going to assert your Fifth Amendment right, we're going to do X, Y, Z, like throw you in jail for contempt. Um, 
So a right protects you absolutely from those things, okay? So a right to protect your sources would mean that the government can't punish you in some way from not, for not answering their question or revealing the sources. Now, can you have some kind of privilege that is not a right? Well, I guarantee you teams like Meadows are gonna run this as a nag because they do it on every topic. They'll say, we should respect confidential sources but not call it a right. And then they'll read a critique like rights talk or legalism that says like creating things as legal rights is bad. Legal rights are fiction, blah, 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 blah. Okay. <clears throat> so in looking at, you know, the various state approaches and whatnot, there's not really any like, you know, sustained debate over should this be a right? Should we call it a right? Like that's not really the language that people use. Um, they more use the language of privilege. So a privilege is like when you, you know, have doctor patient privilege, your doctor can't reveal your medical information to anyone else, okay? And so basically what a privilege is, is it's like a pact between two people to keep information secret, okay? And that's viewed kind of differently from a right, which is like an individual protection against the government. Um, so there may be negative strategies that, you know, kind of are based on, let's not call it a right. There, as far, as far as I can tell, aren't really like solvency advocates or cards about that. So those strategies are most likely going to be sort of generic rights, bad kind of cards, and then just like the assertion that that's a net benefit. All right, so have the right um, and to protect the identity of confidential sources. Um, so one thing that we've talked about at practice a couple times is the difference between a confidential source and confidential information. Okay, so let's say uh, Will Berlin is a WikiLeaks employer or employee, okay? And I come to him and I say, I have this packet of U.S. government documents. Okay, here you go. Publish these. Okay, so what the topic is saying is that Will Berlin can protect my identity. He can not be forced by the government to reveal my name, but not that he can protect that confidential information. Um, so this, there's like a, a couple of different ways this could come up in the context of the topic. Um, so for example, we'll talk a little bit about the Pentagon Papers, which is like a famous court decision about prior restraint and newspapers revealing national security information. Okay, so it's already established law that the government can't stop newspapers from publishing something. That's not really what the topic is about. There is no prior restraint. Okay, but what the topic is about is that after newspapers publish things, okay, the government oftentimes will want to prosecute or punish people responsible for leaking that confidential information. Okay, and so what the topic is about is naming sources. Um, so sometimes the government's not trying to get reporters to name a source. They're trying to get reporters to say, like, when did you meet with the source? Um, okay, that information is oftentimes referred to as metadata. Metadata is like, like if I send Beats an email and in that email, I'm like, I like McDonald's. The fact that I like McDonald's is data. The fact that I sent the email to Beats, that there was a connection between those two people is metadata. So a lot of what surveillance is, is not so much looking at data, like what is the content of people's emails, but looking at metadata, like who is talking to who. And so what the government's trying to do by figuring out who's talking to who is figuring out, you know, how this information leaked. Can we use those like phone records, for example, to figure out how the information got from person A to person B to person C. Um, so the confidential sources thing is most likely just about the names. Um, and so what we're really talking about is naming sources, not revealing public information or classified information. Um, and so that potentially could impact affirmative solvency. Like it means that not as much things are covered as some people would like. Um, or it could be a T issue if affirmatives are going to be about things that are not informants, but about information, um, then we're going to need to read a T argument that says you can protect the sources, but you can't protect the information itself. Um, all right, I want to talk a little bit about established law, so things that would help you to know um, about the topic. Um, so Brandsburg v. Hayes um, is the most important Supreme Court decision um, about journalistic privilege. Okay, so that was a Supreme Court decision in 1972. Okay, so that's a long time ago. It's almost like 60 years ago. But the important thing to know is that since 1972, in that interim time, the Supreme Court has refused to comment again about this issue. Okay, so basically the thing you need to know about how the Supreme Court works is that depending on the year, the Supreme Court takes or accepts, um, you know, like approximately 100 cases. Okay, and so 
we don't know anything about the way the Supreme Court works. It's not like other courts. So like other courts, the way it works is, uh, you know, you get a court date like July 3rd and then the prosecution shows up and they can present their case for as long as they want. They can present their case for months or years if they want. And then the defense gets as long as they want to offer their defense. And then there's a break for jury deliberation. And then as soon as the jury decides, the decision gets announced. OK, the way the Supreme Court works is they figure out what cases they want to, quote unquote, take. OK, so out of, let's say, the hundred cases that the Supreme Court ends up taking, there was probably an additional like 1,000 to 100,000 other cases that the Supreme Court could have taken. OK, so the, the justices, uh, probably more likely their clerks, um, have all these applications or what are known in the legal world as writs where people are appealing decisions to the Supreme Court. OK, so the way that works is, I, I, let's say I'm a journalist and I refuse to give a source's name and so I'm held in contempt. Then I appeal that to like the state Supreme Court and I lose. Then I appeal that to the district court and I lose. Then after I go through all these kind of lower courts, the court of last resort is the Supreme Court. So the 100 cases that the Supreme Court hears each year are 100 cases where someone has already appealed up the chain of command and is now looking for a decision to get reversed by the Supreme Court. OK, now of those 100 decisions, essentially the court gets wide latitude to pick what they want. So if I'm a new justice on the Supreme Court, and my pet issue is affirmative action, you know, I can lobby the other justices to try and hear cases about affirmative action so that I can try and make the kind of ruling that I want. Okay, so when I say the Supreme Court hasn't touched on this issue since 1972, I do not mean there has been no cases where this is relevant. What I mean is that the Supreme Court has either chosen to ignore those cases, like they didn't pick them because they didn't want to comment on the issue, or the members of the court think this is like settled law, and so there's nothing new to kind of say on that issue. Okay, so in, you know, again, let's say 60 years, 100 court decisions, so that's like 6,000 court decisions, to have none of them deal with journalist privilege seems a little odd. And so the fact that they haven't spoken about it in such a long time is like an important thing that a lot of people, when they're writing about this, talk about. Okay, so in the 1972 Brandsburg decision, um, that was, I think, three cases that got sort of um, combined by the court. Um, but basically, that reporter was doing a series of articles about like um, kind of like inner city life and drug culture. Um, and in the process of following people around, listening to their stories, you know, kind of doing journalism things, um, they observed some of those people committing crimes. OK, so I, I don't exam remember exactly what they all were, but one of them was like, uh, somebody was like manufacturing drugs. And so they subpoenaed the journalist and they're like, hey, you wrote the story in the story. You talked about how people were preparing drugs. That's illegal. We want you to give us the names of these people. OK. And the reporter was like, nope, not going to do it. Um, I'm going to maintain the confidentiality of the sources. OK, so that person was brought to a grand jury, which we kind of talked about, um, which is what determines where charges should be brought. OK, now in this instance, OK, if you if all the police have to go on is a news story that says anonymous did something. OK, there's not really a lot of different ways the police can pursue that lead. Like they don't have alternative ways to investigate that. And so that's one of the things that the court talked about in their decision was that it may be true that journalists should be able to protect their sources, but if there's no other way for the government to get information that it needs, then that outweighs the journalist's privilege, okay? And so that that basic idea is called a balancing test, and that's something that's common in the law in all areas. So I don't know if you remember back to the qualified immunity topic, we had a bunch of T and counterplan arguments about balancing tests. But so basically, the way rights work is, rights generally represent you or a narrow interest like you and your friends or something okay so like free speech you have the right to express your opinion okay now you've probably heard the expression you can't shout fire in a crowded theater well what does that mean well what that means is that it, were you to shout fire there would be some sort of stampede of people trying to get out and that would create you know uh, an unsafe environment in which people would likely be injured OK, so when we say you can't yell fire in a crowded theater, what we're saying is that your right to self-expression, OK, is being balanced against a broader, you know, societal or community right to safety and that that safety right is more important than your individual right. OK, so because this reporter was the only one who had information that could resolve these crimes, essentially what the court said is the court said that the, the privilege can't be this strong. It can't be absolute. 
And so because the only way to get this information is for you to violate it, um, then you have to do that. OK. And so that's sort of what the, the grand jury process um, decided. OK. So after the uh, journalist refuses to name a source, OK, they're held in contempt. OK. So contempt basically means like you've disobeyed or you've not followed a rule of the court or the judge. OK. So you're in trial. Uh, you're sorry, you're on trial for a crime and you keep interrupting the prosecution's witness. Like the prosecution is like, did you see the victim uh, interact with the defendant? And you're like, I object. And you're, you know, you're not supposed to be doing that. The lawyer's supposed to be doing that. You keep interrupting the proceeding. OK, what the judge does is they say, OK, I'm going to hold you in contempt. And generally what that means is that you're put in prison. Well, I guess not prison, jail. Um for the duration of the trial, or in some jurisdictions, the judge can like add time on to that. So like a 30 or 60 day contempt uh, charge is like pretty common. So what that means is that at the end of the trial, you would have to report to jail for 30 days. OK, and so that's most of the time when people say like journalists are being jailed. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about like the journalist was accused of a crime, found guilty and sent off to prison. What they're saying is that in like most likely a grand jury investigation, that reporter was called. They were asked who their source was. They refused to identify them. And then the judge said, well, I'm going to hold you in contempt. And so contempt is like, you know, it's basically like a, a very dumbed down version of torture. It's like I'm going to make you uncomfortable by requiring you to live uh, in jail. And then hopefully after a long enough time of being uncomfortable, um, you'll crack and give us the information that you want. Um, so while, you know, contempt generally is like a short thing, like a couple of days or something. There are journalists who, you know, because they won't reveal their sources, will be in jail for like hundreds, if not more days on some sort of contempt charge. OK, so the, the final decision in Brandenburg was a 5-4. OK, and so essentially what the court ruled is the court ruled that the First Amendment did not create a constitutional right um, to withhold confidential sources. Okay, so the First Amendment has sort of various parts. Um, we've talked about the, the sort of journalism part in the past with the Chronicle Affirmative, but there's, there's sort of like the press clause of the First Amendment, and that's the part of the First Amendment that says, like, should make no laws interfering with the press. Okay, and so if you remember from the um, the college free speech topic, there's like a whole bunch of like legal nerds who argue about what the press means in the Constitution and what the press clause means. Um, so, for example, to get back to like what is a reporter, one of the key arguments that people read against the Chronicle AF was that the press in the First Amendment only referred to professional journalists and not to student journalists because the press was um, like a, an employment, a calling, not like a thing you did. Um, and so if you weren't a member of the professional press, then you weren't entitled to protected speech classification. Um, so in essence, what the court is deciding here is they're trying to decide, um, is this person's activity as a journalist enough to sort of give them protection of controversial sources? So the decision was 5-4, okay? But in reality, the decision was 4-4-1, okay? And what I mean by that is that there were four justices who clearly thought there shouldn't be a privilege. There were four justices who thought there should be a privilege. And then there was one in the middle. And that middle person is Justice Lewis Powell. Um, and so that person basically tried to make a very narrow, precise ruling and in the process screwed it up um, for everyone who would follow after them. OK, so essentially what Powell wanted to say was there is a journalist privilege. It does not have to be rooted in the First Amendment. And it does not necessarily protect this particular journalist. OK, so there's something that the courts do a lot of times, which is called distinguishing. Um, when you distinguish a decision or when you distinguish a verdict, what you're essentially saying is um, in this set of circumstances, this ruling is true. But if those circumstances change, then the ruling is no longer true. OK, so let's say, for example, your parents were like, you can watch TV uh, if you do your homework. OK, well, if you didn't do your homework, then the conditions have changed and that ruling doesn't apply anymore. OK, so what Powell was trying to do was say that this particular case, uh, Brandsburg, might not warrant some level of protection or uh, a right to protect confidential sources. But that didn't mean that that, you know, privilege of journalists is not something that should exist, that it could exist in other circumstances were some of these things to change. Okay, and so people who have since this decision wanted to argue against the privilege, 
just sort of selectively take things Powell said um, and interpret them in a way that, you know, benefits their their cause. Um, and people who want to argue for a privilege, you know, kind of do the opposite. They point to parts of Powell's um, decision that would justify it. OK, so the court hasn't spoken on this in a long time. And the original decision is kind of hotly contested. Like no one really agrees what it said. And that's sort of like why there's so much like why disparate evidence on this topic, even just about like what the current law is, um, let alone how we should change it moving forward. Okay, let's talk a little bit about district courts. Um, So district courts are like lower federal courts. Um, So not every federal case goes to the Supreme Court, obviously. Um, So federal and state courts are different for those of you who are kind of new to debate. So states have laws. The federal government has laws. If you violate a state law, um, then you go to state court. If you violate a federal law, you go to federal court. So in the instance of the National Security Act, the like kind of feminist security studies one, okay, the reason the state's counterplan doesn't make sense against that case Um, is because what that case is talking about is people who are being charged under the Espionage Act. So espionage is like spying. That's a federal crime. Okay, so if I'm charged with espionage, the state that I live in, California, is irrelevant. They don't play any part in that. The state police don't come get me. There's no state district attorney prosecuting me. I don't go before a state judge. Okay, a federal law enforcement agency like the FBI would arrest me, and the federal um, AUSA would be in charge of prosecuting me. Okay, so there are district courts, then there are sort of circuit courts, which is like um, sort of like the state Supreme Court level. And then there's the actual Supreme Court. Okay, so there's 13 circuit courts that encompass the U.S. All of them have ruled differently about what Brandsburg means slash what the level of privilege um, journalists deserve uh, is. So. That creates a lot of problems, particularly reporters don't, you know, always behave or don't always do all their reporting in one area. So if you're like the local reporter for the Sacramento Bee, then, yeah, you're probably covering local politics. But if you're, you know, a foreign policy correspondent for The New York Times, not only are you going all over the U.S., you might be going all over the world. Okay, so you may think that your confidential informant policy is X. Uh, and not know that because you cross state lines into a different area or even just into a different circuit, um, that the privilege is not viewed in the same way there. You don't get the same level of protection. Okay, One of the things SCOTUS was trying to do was encourage lower courts to sort of develop this area of law. Okay, So they thought, you know, giving courts some flexibility, some latitude in how they interpret these issues um, will make it better because courts will find, you know, kind of narrow uh, solutions that fit in their little area. Um, you know, so if you have the D.C. Circuit Court, there might be a lot of different reporting than if you have the Montana Circuit Court, for example. Um, and so the, the courts kind of wanted, the court kind of wanted the lower courts to have this ability to be flexible and, uh, you know, kind of change up what was happening in various areas of the country. But it hasn't really worked that well um, since then. So if there's no conflicting Supreme Court ruling, um, then a circuit or district court ruling is sort of the law for that land. So in the Chronicle app, that was about like the Fifth Circuit hostie decision. Um, So that decision applied to the area around like Illinois, but didn't apply outside of that area. That didn't necessarily stop other areas from citing it as precedent. So like one of our 1AC cards said, um, California was already citing the Illinois decision. Um, weeks later. So it's not necessarily the case that you can't cite other courts, um, but your court can definitely rule in a different way. Uh, And so that would change the precedent for that area. Okay, so what are all these courts disagreeing over? Okay, well, essentially, they're disagreeing over what could be pretty common areas of affirmative and negative ground on this topic. Okay, so the first thing they're disagreeing over um, is the degree of protection. Okay, so before I mentioned balancing tests, So the degree of protection is sort of like how much is the balancing test slanted um, in your favor? Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, so uh, in like equal protection, for example, equal protection is sort of like the idea that you can't have laws that have disparate racial or gender impact. Um, So in equal protection, there are varying degrees of scrutiny that the government's interest is is examined under, um, with the harshest being strict scrutiny. So if there is strict scrutiny of a government interest, that means it's really hard for the government to justify discrimination in that instance. Okay, so in the context of 
journalistic privilege, okay, one of the things that could affect a degree of protection um, is like national security exemptions, okay? So there have been a lot of proposed federal legislation to have a shield. Um, when you propose legislation in the federal level, you have to have a House bill and a Senate bill. Those are two different parts of Congress. Um, and then they get voted on. And if they're similar enough slash the same, then it becomes law. If it's not similar, then it has to go to what's called the conference committee and they have to somehow um, try and strike a compromise. So almost every time a federal shield law has failed, the reason it's failed is because they don't agree about the degree of protection. Um, so like the Senate frequently wants a national security exemption and the House does not. So a national security exemption would say, we can compel you to reveal your source, but only if there's you know like a ticking time bomb terrorism scenario or something like that. Um, so the degree of protection is basically how absolute or to what degree the privilege is protected, respected. Um, so picks about the degree of protection, like the national security one is kind of like the obvious example of that. Um, there's sort of like um, what what is the penalty for um, not revealing your source? So like some affirmatives, I think, or some negatives might not say that you have a right to not withhold your source. Um, but might limit what they can do to journalists. So like it's still, I don't know what you want to call it, like illegal or you can still be held in contempt. But if there's no punishment, then does that really matter? So like one thing would be like journalists can be held in contempt that like avoids the politics disad, but they can't be put in jail for contempt. So it's like there's there's not really any impact to that designation. Um, those are the kind of strategies that would or, or be about the degree of protection. The forum for protection is that's just sort of like, well, where is the government asking you these questions? Like, where does the government want to know your source? So the two most common forums by far are going to be grand jury. So in a grand jury, the government is trying to prosecute someone else for a crime, not the journalist. The journalist is called because them revealing the source would be like powerful evidence that XYZ person did it. Um, so in, in sort of a contemporary example, um, the reality winner situation is about like who leaked these NSA documents. Um, and so essentially what the government wants to do is get journalists to narrow down who they're investigating. OK, so, you know, if you're an NSA consultant, they probably do you know a pretty thorough job of tracking like where you go on your computer. So there'll be like X document leaked. We know that only three people had viewed that document in the last week to leak this format of it. So we need the journalist to sort of. Uh, narrow that down for us, who is in fact responsible, okay? And so a grand jury is generally the government trying to prosecute someone else with a crime. That's hugely the majority of places where this comes up. The second most important place would be in civil proceedings. So civil proceedings are lawsuits that aren't about, you know, crime, criminal proceedings. So like I sue someone because they wrote a, an unfavorable article about me, for example. And in that article, um, they allege that something was a fact. And I'm contesting that it, it's not a fact. So what I would do is I would, in civil court, as I'm suing them, I would want to depose their sources or you know interview their sources to see where they allegedly got this information from. Um, and so journalists in some areas have a criminal privilege. They don't have to reveal to grand juries who their sources were, but they don't get a civil privilege in a proceeding where there's no, you know, the government's not going after a source or something. They've ruled that you don't get to protect your sources because, you know, it's it's different. It's not something where there's a crime involved. And so you don't get the protection. So like Fifth Amendment self-incrimination, you know, could work in maybe a criminal context, but not a civil context, although that's not the way the law works. But that's sort of the way the analogy they're trying to draw here. Um, so those are kind of the two main forums is civil and criminal. Um, and then who gets protection? That's one that we already talked about a little bit. Um, so like who counts as a reporter? Do editors also get reporters privilege? Sort of yada, yada, yada in that vein. Um, so when we say the district courts all have different wordings, it may be that in district one, the degree of protection is qualified. The forum is civil and criminal and who gets the protection is broad. Everyone who you know types in a computer gets it. And then in district two, the degree of protection is very uh, absolute. But the forum is only criminal and who gets it is only people who work for traditional news organizations. So those three things, you know, create a lot of different permutations of who could be covered 
um, under what circumstances, um, the degree of coverage. And then, you know, that's obviously going to affect like what kind of disads you can run and whatnot, because the smaller the case is, the less likely it will um, leak to something like terrorism. Um, but the more likely it is that a small case won't have answers to like a pick, for example. Um, OK, let's talk a little bit about what is a right. OK, so a right is a claim that has to be balanced against competing interests. Um, in this topic, the competing interest is, is usually always going to be the government's interest. So the government wants some piece of information, you know, either to protect national security or to prosecute someone for a crime. A journalist wants to keep that information secret. They don't want to reveal that information. Okay? And so essentially what you're balancing there is like, is the government's interest in knowing this information more or less important than the journalist's right to protect that information? Okay. And so, you know, obviously different government interests can be more or less compelling. If they think that the source of your information could, you know, have vital information about preventing a terror attack, that's going to seem a lot more compelling than if they're just, you know, something trivial like uh, this person may have witnessed a jaywalking and we want to make sure that we, you know, end the scourge of jaywalking. So national security is like overwhelmingly where this this stuff comes up so there are other instances of like whistleblowers you know in corporate areas like the tobacco industry um, you know there are people who reveal non-national security government secrets but for the most part this topic is going to be about that area because that's where most of these things most of these rights are being challenged okay a constitutional right is generally protection from the government. Okay, that's known as a negative right. The government says we will not do X. So, like the Fourth Amendment says, uh, we won't subject you to search and seizure without, you know, uh, a warrant. Well, essentially, what they're saying is we won't do X. That's a negative right. Okay, a positive right would be the government owes you something. Okay, so like if the federal government said it, that we're going to pass a right to a universal basic income, that would mean that the government had to give you something, a check every month. That's a positive right. A negative right is limiting the government's uh, coercion of you, saying the government can't do something to you. Okay, so in this instance, the government is not going to compel you to reveal your source. Now, before we said there could be like a civil aspect of this, that might not be the government. That might be another private individual trying to compel you to reveal your source. Um, so if that's the case, then, you know, it's slightly different. You're, you're balancing a different interest. But that's what a right means. It means it's a balancing test. And how we're sort of implementing that balancing test is looking at whose you know, claim is more important. Is it more important to protect national security and stop terrorism? Or is it more important to protect freedom and liberty um, in the press? Um, so how does the government compel? Well, the biggest way is the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act is with a law from like 1917 that literally says nothing that the government just sort of um, it's like a Rorschach test. They can interpret it to mean kind of whatever they want. And so if you, let's say, gave WikiLeaks NSA documents about drone strikes in Yemen, what the government would say is, oh, there's information in there that uh, you know could compromise our sources um, or could reveal the identity of U.S. secret agents or something along those lines. And they'll say, therefore, this person has put national security um, at risk and they should be prosecuted under the Espionage Act. Um, there are other like crime enforcement or obstruction of justice issues. Um, those are usually like you reported on, you know, a, a certain kind of crime, like you went undercover in a drug organization and saw what they were doing or something. Um, so those are far less common, but those also exist. Um, and then contempt charges. So a lot of times government pursuit of journalists can seem sort of petty and that it's not really like principled. It's more just sort of like a uh, a little spat that the district attorney is having with that reporter and that that can often be the case based on the articles that I've read is that they just don't like it when journalists don't play ball. Um, and so sometimes they'll get contempt hearings or uh, sentences where it'll be like 120 days, which is like, you know, more time than you do in prison than for murdering someone in Florida. But it's like, that's just sort of the, the way the law works is that if someone has an ax to grind against you, um, they can take it out on you in some pretty ridiculous ways sometimes. So contempt charges are sort of the, the way the government, when they're not actually prosecuting you with a crime, um, will try and compel you to testify. Um, does a right have to be legislative or can it be established by the court? Okay, so there'll definitely be an agent counterplan debate on this topic. Um, you know, 
uh, one group already turned out the court counterplan. Um, and that article is like one of the ones that shows up for every Lexus law review search of this topic. Um, so that's definitely something that people are going to be thinking about slash reading. Um, so a negative could establish competition for the court counterplan by somehow defining the term right as being like a right as something um, established in statute or something that's legislatively created. Um, and then saying, oh, the court is not creating a right. They're just recognizing this privilege. It's not as formal. It's not the same legally. Um, and so then they'll try and, you know, either read like a politics dissent or some kind of critique about it not being a right. Um, conversely, the affirmative may want to try and avoid politics dissents entirely because there's not a lot of great net ground on this topic um, by saying they use the court and then, you know, doing kind of a similar thing, only the opposite, saying the courts can create rights. They don't have to create it by statute. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So we may uh, be able to generate a T argument about the affirmative needs to use legislation uh, and establish competition for our court counterplan that way. Um, but um, as I and a couple of the other people on the team who have looked into trying to find definitions to support these strategies, we've all kind of come to the conclusion that right is not a word with like a really good definition that could establish counterplan competition. So we may still write this strategy, but it, it's probably more of like a cheese strategy um, than an actual substance strategy. Okay, the last thing we'll talk about in this session is what is a privilege? Okay, so a privilege generally is a right to not disclose or reveal information. Okay, so kind of the ones you see on TV a lot, it's like priests. So uh, in the Catholic Church, you have confession, which is you're supposed to um, go to the priest and tell them all the bad things that you did. Um, so obviously, if the priest could then turn around and tell the cops that no one would go to confession. So there's sort of a common law understanding um, that priests have a privilege. So earlier when I talked about Brandsburg, I mentioned that the court found no First Amendment basis for confidentiality. Um, so what that means is that they looked at the literal words in the First Amendment, did not see the word confidential or privilege, and were like, okay, no privilege exists, next. Okay, well, in addition to, I guess, sort of actual law, um, we have a tradition in the U.S. that we got from Britain called common law. And so the kind of idea behind common law is that if something is established as a tradition for like decades, if not hundreds of years, um, then it's unreasonable to say, uh, prosecute people for going against common sense. Um, so I'm pretty sure there's no like official U.S. statute. Uh, it's definitely not in the Constitution um, that says that priests get this kind of confidentiality. It's a holdover from English common law. Um, lawyers, that's more of a statutory privilege, but the way privilege works with your lawyer is basically you are protected from any past criminal acts. So, you know, you, you are charged with murder. You committed the crime. So you hire a lawyer and you're like, I did it. That lawyer can't then go to the prosecutor and be like, he did it. I, I'll testify against him. OK, so lawyers, most of the time, um, they can't be forced to testify against you if you said you committed X criminal act in the past. Um, but they can be forced to testify if you, like, plan a future criminal conspiracy with them, okay? Because otherwise, like, the way to get out of, you know, ever being convicted of anything would just be to say that everyone in your little criminal conspiracy is a lawyer, and therefore none of you can be compelled to testify against the other one. Um, and then doctors. So doctors can't reveal your, like, private medical information. So, like, if you've been diagnosed with something, they can't tell people that. They can't tell, like, what kind of medication you're on. Um Again, less of sort of like a statute federal law thing, more of sort of like a medical ethics thing. Um, I'm pretty sure in the majority of states, if you disclose medical information, it's not a crime. It's like a civil issue where you can sue the doctor, um, although that's definitely not true in all states. So those are groups that we kind of widely recognize as having a privilege. OK, they don't have to reveal information. The government can't compel them to reveal information except you know, under the exemptions that we just kind of outlined. Okay, and as a general rule, it protects past wrongdoing, but not future. Okay, so even if you were a reporter and we had an absolute reporter privilege, if someone that you were interviewing was like, I'm going to blow up the sun next week with this neutrino bomb, like you would not be protected from revealing that. That's not, that's not what it does. It doesn't protect future bad acts, it only protects past. Um, and the degree of when those exemptions are would all be important parts of federal shield legislation. So obviously for the lawyer one, the like past crime versus future crime makes sense um, because otherwise people would be uh, 
you know, getting lawyers to commit crimes with them. Um, for the priests, uh, you know, it's, it's generally the same thing, but that's from common law, not because of any other exemption. So for journalists, you know, we would probably need to think about like what would be reasonable cases where a journalist um, revealing the source wouldn't compromise, you know, their ability to gather the news, but might protect society. That's sort of like what you'd be thinking about when writing um, a pick on this topic. So like one of the articles that I read was basically about like, what if um, your confidential informant dies? Okay, so let's say um, I'm investigating, you know, atrocities that the U.S. committed during the Vietnam War. And Bob will uh, talk to me, but only under the condition of confidentiality. And then I'm, you know, writing the story for like six months to a year because it's a long form investigative journalism article. After speaking to me, Bob passes away. Okay, well, in some instances, there might be, you know, different people who have different opinions about whether or not you should reveal Bob. So like your editor might be pressuring you to reveal Bob's name because it will make the story look more credible. So like, for example, there's no federal law about like what stories can do with sourcing, but most newspapers have sourcing policies. Like you can't publish something, uh, you can't say, you know, X is a fact if you only have one source who's unwilling to say it on the record. Um, so for a lot of people, you know, the pressure to name sources can come from uh, higher ups in their corporate hierarchy, not so much from the government. Um, so those could all be important parts of federal protection that could affect what is and is not a privilege. Um, and so while right now they're not like the basis of any of our strategies, they could certainly be, you know, I could see like a lot of kind of Brent Woody style negative strategies where they just find like a newspaper article where the author doesn't really understand privilege. And so they say something like, you know, we shouldn't have an absolute privilege. We should have you know, a modified privilege where the reporters, if they consult with their editors, are able to reveal the source names or something like that. And it's like those kind of picks will be annoying. But like if you now kind of understand the way the legal system works, hopefully you'll be able to explain that. Well, no, like just saying the editor said I could keep the name quiet doesn't stop you from being thrown in jail for contempt, for example. Like those kind of things are just sort of like you're never going to have a card on, but hopefully um, you'll now know a little bit more about them. Um, so we'll wrap it up for there and we'll we'll talk about some of the other ones in part two.